thank you. Uh, thank you, Comedy Unleashed. Nice to be here. They said uh, I could say anything, so let's get the fuck into it straight away. Um, here is, I don't like Poland. There you go. <laughs> been there, it's full of crap, people are all tramps, I don't like Poland, sorry Poundland, I don't like Poundland. <laughs> this is good, this is nice, nice venue, fantastic venue for comedy, the best venues for comedy, I don't know if you know this, actually nursing homes, you know that? <laughs> Well, that's true, there's no pressure, doesn't matter whether you're funny or not, there's always someone sat there pissing themselves, so... <laughs> <that's>, uh... <laughs> I don't really know what this gig is about, I'll be honest, I don't know what this gig is about. I just sort of uh, turned up slightly late, I caught the last minute of the second half. What the fuck is going on? What's happened to Jack Whitehall's hand? What the fuck is... <laughs> It's good that you've come out on a Tuesday. Man, it's, it takes an effort, I think, doesn't it? Go out on a Tuesday. <laughs> You're right, what's happened down here? <laughs> How many fucking jackets have you got? Just the, <laughs> just the two. And that person's left their jacket there. <laughs> oh, it's all too tempting, but no, fuck it. <laughs> We'll leave it. Welcome for coming out. It takes an effort on a Tuesday. A lot of time, you step outside the front door, weather's horrible. Uh, streets horrible, buses horrible, traffic's horrible. People say, oh, it's nice to get out of the house. I think your house must be shit. Where's all the house? <laughs> are you, uh, <laughs> are you living in? What a wonderful thing! Uh, um, uh, uh, a, a free speech comedy club and uh, slightly sad as well because it should be every fucking comedy club and uh... <laughs> and it isn't, it used to be but it isn't anymore and it's silly you know it's silly pandering to people who get upset and offended by things oh, I'm sorry, you, you made a joke and it hurt my feelings Andrew <laughs> you hurt my feelings well Clearly, I didn't make a very good job of it, because... <laughs> you stood there telling me all about it. <laughs> Next time I try a little bit harder, hopefully you'll fucking kill yourself. What about that? <laughs> a lot of... <laughs> I think a lot of people don't really have a sense of humour about death. I've discovered that. A lot of people don't have a sense. Apparently, if someone collapses and dies whilst participating in Race for Life, it's inappropriate to point out the irony of the situation. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I don't know. Strange times. Strange times we live in. And uh, it's lovely. It's nice to get out and uh, do a gig on a Tuesday night. I've got um, a, a toddler running around at home now. Don't know why, probably looking for a way out so she could try and find her parents. <laughs> <laughs> Feels like uh, there's some couples in. I think there's some couples in. It's nice to, nice to see. I'll tell you this. I don't, I don't know what you'll think of this. This might prove to be slightly controversial. I'm, I'm um, 38 years old and uh, my partner is 25. Hey. Well... Part of, me, part of me feels it's wrong, um, inappropriate, too much of an age gap, but there's another part of me that thinks... So <laughs> 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 you, she's 25, it's tough, people judge you, you know? People treat you like a paedophile. <laughs> When are they going to accept this is a serious relationship? We're going out for 10 years now. How long is it going to take me? Uh... <laughs> I have 
have I've got I have got a, a um, I've got I've got a three year old daughter. I've got a three year old daughter. And this is a tough job to do when you have a, a little family because you're travelling around all the time. I am um, uh, like there's gigs in India now. I was off in India doing some gigs and I'll tell you what I found out when I was in India. You may notice the top selling beauty product in India, skin lightening cream. <laughs> Cream to make your skin paler. Something a little bit racist about that. I thought, I'm going to give this a try. I might have overdone it, to be honest with you. <laughs> but all the family are going to say, you want to go back to Trinidad? So I don't know. <laughs> travel a lot of travel and uh, of course you have to try and um, stay in touch with things doing this as well you have to try and keep things current you have to try and know what's going on in the world a little bit I try to read the newspapers as much as I can tolerate it and I, an interesting thing I read the other day um, it's now surgically possible to give someone a full face transplant incredible apparently not an appropriate anniversary gift but uh, <laughs> It's important to be learning, isn't it? I have to always be learning. I went to my local uni one afternoon last week for one of those, so, um, one of those uh, um, uh, 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 sexual consent awareness workshops. <laughs> Wasn't invited, just so I pushed my way in. Love, yes. <laughs> 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 A three-year-old daughter. Who's giving you? Have you got kids? Yeah. Yeah, you sound tired and regretful. Um, <laughs> man, it's tough, isn't it? It's a, a, a tough thing. My, um, people wind you up when they find out you're having a baby. So, having a baby's easy, Andrew. All you got to do is keep it alive. It's not that straightforward. <laughs> Some days I don't want to. <laughs> People say parenthood is a magical journey, but it seems to me if you take enough drugs first, so it's a bus ride to the abortion clinic, so... <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> oh. Now I'm getting a feel for the room. <laughs> I think that's one of the worst jobs you could do if you're a woman uh, working in an abortion clinic. It must be awful. Imagine you're walking in. 10 o'clock, 9 o'clock in the morning, walking into work every day. People in the office across the road watching you thinking, there she goes again. <laughs> she never learns. <laughs> Three-year-old daughter. Three-year-old daughter is tough. She's bossy. Comes into my room six o'clock every morning. Let's take this stinky nappy off. Let's take this stinky nappy off. I'm like, Listen, it's my nappy. I wear as long as I want. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you know I'm bored with this idea. I've got a three-year-old daughter. You mean to tell me you had sex with an actual woman, Andrew? Uh, she had a child and agreed to have you involved in its parenting in some way. So it's all a little bit far-fetched, I agree with you. <laughs> it surprised me too. I'd, uh, I'd be going out with my partner two weeks. She said, I'm pregnant, Andrew. What a shock. We hadn't even had sex. Uh, <laughs> very powerful sperm. Um, people, say, <laughs> people say, does your daughter look like you, Andrew? She does, but Chinese. That's the... Uh, <laughs> Very powerful sperm. I tried to donate some of my sperm once, but um, they didn't want it at the Oxfam shop. Um, <laughs> left some on the counter for them anyway. <laughs> so for goodness sake, couldn't you put it in a container first? Come on now, no some charity. <laughs> well, um, yeah, they get away with a lot. Toddlers get away with a lot, don't they? My daughter went to bed last month. My partner said, that's all right, sweetheart. Everyone has accidents, don't worry about it. I went to bed last Friday. Apparently, I'm an alcoholic. How's that work? <laughs> anyway, it's good. Yeah, it's good to be out, out of the house. And uh, it's good that you've all come. I apologise for this um, 
pubic disgrace of a beard on my face, I realise it doesn't look great, it looks like I've trimmed it off my balls, glued it to my chin. <laughs> Better than the alternative, trust me, I'll go clean shaven, I'll just look like an angry lesbian art teacher. And I have, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for visualising that, confirming it for me. Huh? <laughs> Decent looking crowd tonight, well done. Decent looking crowd, you know, solid looking, I like that. Nothing spectacular, but that's a good thing. <laughs> Sometimes I'm on stage, I look out in the audience, there's an array of very attractive people, it's distracting. It distracts me from the task at hand. Tonight, I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I am um, well dressed, smart looking, a lot of people in suits, well done. I, I, um, I went out shopping with my partner, she was shopping for work clothes this afternoon, and. Uh, I noticed on the high street, women's clothes are considerably cheaper than men's. One shop I went into, a men's jeans, shocked by that, why wouldn't you be? Uh, one shop, men's jeans, £40, almost practically the same pair of women's jeans, £20. I'm quite a tight-fisted individual, I'm thinking about going trans just for the 50% discount. Why not? Everybody's getting up to all sorts of things, that's the world we live in now, as bisexuals and transsexuals, pansexuals, which I think is fine as long as you wash them up before you start cooking them. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people questioning themselves, a lot of people questioning their identity, a lot of people uh, questioning their gender, people, people transitioning from one gender to another. Fine, fair enough, doesn't do anyone else any harm. Just makes life slightly more complicated. <laughs> Ten years ago, I met a woman I liked, I only needed to ask two questions. Number one, have you got a boyfriend? No. Uh, number two, can I take you out for a drink? That was it. Now there's a third question that comes into play. Have you got a boyfriend? No. Were you born with testicles? No. <laughs> Can I take you out for a drink? It's very important to find out about that testicle situation. Before you commit yourself to something you later regret. You know? You're a man, you're going out with a woman, it's going well. Two weeks later, you're in bed together, you go down there, suddenly you're thinking, hang on a second. This vagina tastes like balls. There's no way back after that. <laughs> All right. I think. You know, I think it's a good thing. I think we should support young people with uh, gender dysmorphia. I think that's, that's a good thing. Kids with gender dysmorphia, support them and talk to them and look after them. And don't jump the gun, I think. You know, don't get too uh, hasty with things. Like, uh, Son, it's your fifth birthday. What would you like to do? I'd like to dress up as a princess, Daddy. Fair enough, we'll put you into the mermaid clinic. we we'll get you on the... Uh... <laughs> Get you on the hormone blocker, son. You're never too early to start your transition. Just, just start dressing, start. That's it. It's all right, son. You can tell us. <laughs> I wish I thought about where I was going with this bit of material before I started it. <laughs> the world we live in, why not? Complicated times. Very uh, feminised times, I think. I remember a simpler time. I remember a time someone said to you, I'm going to give you a fat lip. That was a threat of violence. Now it's an offer of cosmetic surgery. It's a different, <laughs> different world we live in, of course it is, and uh, there's a lot of bad people out there. You know, I don't think I'm the most compassionate person in the world. I was uh, reading an article in a newspaper last week about um, a 23-year-old woman who's messing around. She was seeing how many Jaffa cakes she could fit in her mouth. <laughs> and she accidentally choked to death. And a compassionate person would think, oh, that's a tragic waste of a young life. But my initial thought was, mmm, Jaffa cakes. And, uh... <laughs> Very next page is a woman in, the, in, in Aldi, and, and she, an elderly lady, and she slipped on a bag for life, cracked her head off the floor, and died. And, died, and a compassionate person think that's someone's grand, that's someone's mum. But my thought was, um, technically you can't call that a bag for life. <laughs> if you're gonna put a label on it, you'd have to call it a bag of death, something like that. I don't know what you thought it, but I don't know, there's bad people out there, of course there is. So. 
troubled times we live in, and uh, I don't know, I don't know, I just, um, there's a lot of identity politics, I don't really get on board with it. I think we're all the same, aren't we? We're all struggling one way or another. Life is hard. Life is hard if you're a brown person in an airport. If you're a brown person in an airport, you always get stopped and searched at security gates. It's tough, you know, it's degrading, humiliating, but also, life is hard if you're a white person in an airport. You always have to queue up for ages at the security gates. <laughs> Waiting for all the brown people to be stopped and searched! <laughs> Whoever you are, airports are appalling! <laughs> Don't get me wrong, you know, there's, there's a lot of racism in the world. There's a lot of racism, there's a lot of discrimination in the world. I was driving home late at night from a gig a couple of weeks ago, I got stopped. I got pulled over by the police for no reason at all, which I thought was very unfair, because I'm not even black. <laughs> no, the girl in my boot was, but I, you know... Uh... <laughs> Any racists in, give me a chair? <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> I'm a little bit racist. I'm a little bit racist. Don't get me wrong, I've got a lot of brown friends, I've got a lot of black friends, I've got a lot of oriental friends, and they're all cunts, they're all cunts! <laughs> but they're not as cunty as the white people I know, white people are the cuntiest people, particularly white women, white women are the cuntiest people of all, and even they're not as cunty as disabled people, disabled people are the cuntiest people, ginger disabled people, oh my god! I'm glad they can't walk. Ginger disabled people are so cunty. It's nice now if I go upstairs, they can't follow me. That's the uh... <laughs> I don't know, you know. Of course, you know, it helps in comedy now. It helps to be woke if you want to get on the... The BBC, you want to get on Channel 4, you've got to be woke, but I, I, I'm not woke, I'm not woke. <laughs> Have I awoken? Possibly. Am I awakened? Perhaps, but unfortunately I'm not woke because I spent four years doing a Masters in English and uh, before I even begin to contemplate being woke uh, as an ideological standpoint, first of all I have to come to terms with the fact that it's a fucking grammatical abomination. <laughs> With that. <laughs> I don't know, as a, uh, as a straight, uh, straight white, white male, it's incumbent upon me to check my privilege, isn't it? To know my privilege. Well, I think about it a lot. I think about my privilege. Uh, every day I, um, I wake up in my mansion, uh, pull back my duck feather duvet, um, roll off my Egyptian cotton bed sheets onto my heated floor and uh, I saunter into my ensuite bathroom, take a piss. Sometimes I just piss on the floor. Um, <laughs> clap my hands, my Filipino maid comes and mops it all up. If she's too slow, I slap her around a little bit. And uh, all the time I'm thinking about my privilege. And, uh, it's a privilege just to be here tonight. Apart from, uh, apart from America, the UK, I think, is the world's biggest, most thriving hub of stand-up comedy. Incredible. Elite level comedians from all over the world come to the UK uh, to live and to work, which is, it's annoying. It's annoying for me. <laughs> I'm just trying to make a living. Suddenly all these incredible international comedians turn up going for the same crap you'll pay gigs I'm going for. No offense, Anna. <laughs> I've got to work harder up my game, it's really eroding my quality of life. Sometimes I'm on a gig with some incredible international comedian, they're bringing a the house down, everyone's rolling around with laughter. I'm at the back of the room thinking, this is all very well, but I hope your visa expires soon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, you have to hustle, of course. If you're a freelance comedian, you've got to be hustling, looking for work on the phone, chasing gigs. I, uh, I phoned a production company last week I used to do a lot of work for and um, I said, what's going on guys? I don't hear from you anymore, what's happening? And they said, comedy's changed, Andrew. <laughs> so what, what do you mean? It's all about equality and diversity now. But I, I'm still funny, but it's not really about that, Andrew. So... <laughs> But 
I got good jokes. No one wants to hear jokes now, Andrew. <laughs> no one wants to hear jokes. What do they want to hear? They want to hear you say something socially aware on a contentious issue, Andrew. That's all they want to hear. <laughs> so that they can agree with you, nod their heads and clap their hands. Well, uh, 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 that's not really... I don't have anything like that, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I've got family to support. You got nothing for me? Sorry, Andrew, sorry. What about your partner? Is she funny? Well, yes, yeah, at the moment, yeah. Uh, could she stand on stage chatting for ten minutes? Probably. I, I imagine she could. But is she available next Tuesday evening for a recording of Live at the Apollo? But hang on! <laughs> she hasn't done the stage time. She hasn't got the experience. You put her in a pressure cooker environment like that, she's probably going to die a horrible death. Doesn't matter, Andrew. We fix all that in the edit these days. It's the magic of technology. <laughs> We'll put her in next Tuesday evening live in the Apollo Andrew. Trouble is, she's only ticking one equality and diversity box at the moment. Any other boxes she could tick for us? Any disabilities? Oh, well, not really, no. Could she put on a limp? Well, I... <laughs> how much are you going to pay her? It's 12 grand for live in the Apollo Andrew. For 12 grand, she'd probably sit in a wheelchair for you. <laughs> Ask her nicely, she'd probably dribble down herself. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, and uh, yes, I've got. Um, you can't sell yourself too cheap either. I had an email last week from uh, someone saying, oh, "I've got a three-day run of gigs for you, Andrew. Three-day run of gigs for you, fifteen hundred quid. You interested? Sounds good. Who's it for? Military gigs, Andrew, for the forces. Oh, great. Where have I got to go? Middle East. Ah, well, <laughs> whereabouts in the Middle East? Can't tell you that, Andrew. Basically, RAF lawyer out of the Middle East. Three-day run of gigs, fifteen hundred quid. RAF fly back home. So I put you in for that one. Let me just check my diary. Um, um. <laughs> No! No, I can't make that! I've not told you the date yet, Andrew. I'm just snowed under at the moment. I've got a lot. Don't get me wrong, I'm not averse to the idea of going to hostile territory, doing a few gigs for the forces, why not? But the money's got to be right, do you know what I mean? If something goes wrong, I a landmine or something, I feel like 1,500 quid isn't going to cover it. I don't know. I don't know how much prosthetic limbs cost these days, but I'm fairly sure for a grand and a half, I'm not going to get anything of any significant quality. And the thing about prosthetic limbs, you don't want to buy cheap, do you? Like, you find yourself in a scenario where you've got to buy a prosthetic limb, treat yourself. You know you're going to use it. <laughs> Splash out on something decent. Oh, I don't know. Everything's so expensive, isn't it? <laughs> you've got to be earning a living now. Everything costs a fucking fortune and... Uh, you know, it just um, feels like people have been ripping us off for years. Uh, energy suppliers, ripping us off for years. I remember when I was younger, um, from time to time, I'd invite someone back to my flat of an evening and they'd always complain about how cold it was and eventually I'd have to switch the heating on. This would piss me right off. Uh, in the end, I'd just start going out with fat girls because they're just better insulated. <laughs> it's not any cheaper though, because after they've left the next day, they've always got to restock the fridge, so it's a false economy. <laughs> No, it's expensive having kids, man. It's very expensive having uh, kids. Like uh, it's my daughter's birthday recently, and my partner said, "Let's take her to the zoo, Andrew. Let's take her. Oh, great, sixty quid, seventy quid for a family ticket to walk around and see a bunch of animals looking miserable. Perfect. And uh, I don't have to spend money to see an animal look miserable. Just call my dog into the kitchen, wave some chicken in his face, put it back in the fridge. That's what I need to do." <laughs> They're boring people. Toddlers are, are, are boring people, but you learn a lot. The most important lesson I learned as a parent is um, uh, a pound land's not the best place to buy condoms, actually. Uh, <laughs> uh, they're boring people. My daughter can talk now, which is nice, but at the same time, I think it's going to be a while before she says anything interesting. Um, <laughs> she comes out with some... Uh, comes out with some odd expressions. <laughs> and, um, the other day, she said, I'm a good girl for treats, Daddy. I'm a good girl for change. I said, well, you're going to have to grow out of that because in the adult world, that's what's commonly referred to as a prostitute. So, 
she repeats herself. That's her main thing she likes to do. She likes to repeat herself. At the end of last year, I bought her a winter coat. She spent three days following me around the house saying, I've got a pocket, Daddy. I've got a pocket, I've got a pocket, Daddy. I've got a pocket. Good for you, well done. I've got a pocket, Daddy. I've got a pocket. I know I bought the coat. I've got a pocket, Daddy. Why don't you have a look inside, see if you can find any other words and phrases out about that? <laughs> I took her to the park, we're in the car, going to the park, so we go to the park, park daddy, yes we are, we go to the park daddy, yep, yeah, that's the plan, go to the park daddy, well we're at home weren't we? I said what would you like to do today, and you said park, so I'll put your willies and your raincoat on, now we're in the car and I'll wait at the park, oh, we go to the park daddy, I'm not sure anymore, we go, we go to the park daddy, now we go to the adoption agency, is that right? <laughs> I look after my daughter most of the time now because um, what happened was uh, my partner had a baby and um, she went out and got a job. Um, she decided she didn't want to be stuck at home <coughs> looking after the kids. She wanted to be out working. It's fair enough, isn't it? 2019, why not? And um, she got a job for uh, Royal Mail. Um, people say, what do you call her? Is she a postwoman, post lady, post person? I'll just call her a bad mother. I don't know if that's... Uh, <laughs> Looking after my daughter um, since she was two months old is fine, straightforward enough. I'm not going to lie, the breastfeeding wasn't easy, but I did what I could. <laughs> Didn't have the nipples or the lactic capabilities for it. Uh, you know, turns out men and women are different. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I, uh, she upset me the other day, my daughter. She said, uh, why can't you just go and do mama's work for her? I said, I don't know. Why couldn't you have been a boy? Um, <laughs> She said, girls can do everything boys can do, Daddy. I said, that's true, and this involves physical strength, spatial awareness, or emotional stability. So... <laughs> But if those differences in ability are true, Dad, would you say they're innate or a question of social conditioning? <laughs> I thought, finally, we're having an interesting conversation, as it were. <laughs> I don't really believe in social conditioning, per se. I think society is very malleable, very fluid, and shifts constantly in accordance with the changing needs and urges of the individuals within it. What do you think? She said, I've got a pocket, Daddy. I've got a pocket. <laughs> Very, uh, I think she's very advanced for her age, actually. I am. Um, well, she was having a bath the other night, and she said, I need to get out, Daddy. And uh, I got her out of the bath, she waddled over the toilet, helped her up on the toilet, she did a pee. I got her off the toilet, she waddled back in the bath, I helped her back in the bath. Extraordinary! I'm almost 39, I wouldn't even bother with all that. <laughs> <laughs> Far too much effort, isn't it? And, uh, put her to bed the other night, she broke my heart a little bit. She said, I'm scared, Daddy. I'm scared. I said, what are you scared of? I'm scared the ghosts are going to come. I said, sweetheart, there's no such thing as ghosts. I said, really, Daddy? I said, really? Serial killers, on the other hand, that's what you've got to keep an eye out for. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Someone asked me something weird quite recently. Um, what did they say? They said, uh, what if your daughter's a lesbian, Andrew? What if your daughter's a lesbian? Why would I care about that? Who gives a, a shit about that in this day and age? What if your daughter's a lesbian, Andrew? If it means she's not going to come home at the age of 16 tell me she's pregnant, I welcome it with open arms. Great. <laughs> My daughter comes home and says, I'm a lesbian, Daddy. I'm going to say, good for you, sweetheart. Get out of there, munch some rugs. Um, <laughs> strap on a dildo, give a slag a pounding. I don't know what you get out to. Just... <laughs> I can tell you straight away my daughter's not a lesbian. How could you possibly know your three-year-old daughter's not a lesbian, Andrew? Well, I heard her laughing the other day, so, you know. Um... <laughs> Draw your own conclusions! <laughs> <laughs> No, you know, I don't, uh, I don't impose gender norms on my daughter, I don't expect her to conform to gender stereotypes, I don't expect her to be interested in, in, in um, dress up like a princess or play with dolls or be interested in pink sparkly things, unless she, you know, she wants it. As it happens, her favourite toys are cars and trucks and diggers, um, traditionally quite boyish toys. Her absolute favourites are aeroplanes, she's fascinated by aeroplanes, which I encourage, I hope she carries that enthusiasm for aeroplanes in her adult life, so one day if she works hard, 
and applies herself, she could be an um, air hostess. Um, <laughs> I'm in charge! I'm in charge! Someone left me in charge of a three-year-old child. I don't know how it happens, but I'm constantly, I try to think of ways to keep her stimulated, entertained. I took her, um, I took her to soft play in a week. I thought she'd have fun at soft play. Some kid came up to her, punched her in the face. Punched my daughter in the face. And I think you learn a lot about your kid in moments like that. My daughter could have crumpled to the ground. She could have run over me crying. Didn't read of those things. This kid punched my daughter in the face instantly. My daughter punched her straight back, not once, three times in quick succession. Because <laughs> as it turns out, I seem to create a psychopath. And then the other kid went flying into the ball pit, shell shocked, didn't bother my daughter after that. It's, it's, it's horrible to see your own child behave with that level of violence. But at the same time, on the way home, I did stop off by her an ice cream. Because uh, <laughs> at the end of the day, knockout's a knockout, isn't it? <laughs> Win's a win! <laughs> well, I don't know. I'll tell you uh, a little bit more about my partner. Um, she's a uh, tea fascist. Uh, you know, it's constantly on you. Make her a cup of tea. And yet when you do, there's always something wrong with it. <laughs> Not enough sugar, too much milk. Didn't leave the tea bag in long enough. The irony is she never seems to notice I spat in it. So I don't know. <laughs> We have been together a while, and I think after you've been together a while, you have to make extra effort in the, um, in the bedroom to keep things interesting, don't you? We were having the old, um, we're having a go at things. <laughs> she started saying, hurt me, Andrew. I want you to hurt me. I didn't really know what to do, so just waited a couple of weeks, forgot to buy her a birthday present. I don't know if that's <laughs> It's far more pleasant in the context of a relationship, that sort of intimacy, isn't it? I, you know, one night stands awkward, anything casual, it can be really awkward. One time I very, had a really awkward casual encounter, I was, I was having sex with someone and she started saying, you're a dirty jippo, Andrew. <laughs> you're a filthy jippo. <laughs> in the end, I was so annoyed, I was like, you know what, get the fuck out of my caravan, I don't want to see you anymore. <laughs> The relationships are easy early on. They're easy early on after a year. You're like, how have I ended up with this incredible person? I won the lottery here. And then after five years, I, I think we found our level in each other. I think we're well matched. <laughs> after 10 years, I, how have I ended up with this prick? I've really sold myself short here. <laughs> after 20 years, I, when's this tosser going to die? And, um, <laughs> life is simpler. Simpler when you live on your own, isn't it? I lived on my own for a little while. I, uh, I used to, life was so easy, I used to leave the toilet seat up all the time. I'd go in, yeah, I'd go in, have a pee and, and flush a chain, wash my hands. Life was so easy and get out of there. And then, um, then I moved in with my partner. The new rule was we keep the toilet seat down all the time. So if I wanted to pee, I'd have to lift up the toilet seat, have a pee, put the toilet seat down, flush a chain, wash my hands. And then now I've got a toddler, we've got a special toddler seat goes on top of the toilet seat. So my door can climb up, use the toilet without falling into it. So now if I want to pee, I've got to remove the toddler seat, lift up the toilet seat, have a pee, put the toilet seat down, replace the toddler seat, wash, flush the chain, wash my hands. Too much hassle, I don't bother with it, I just piss in the sink now. <laughs> Very lucky, very lucky. A lot of responsibilities. Getting old, older, 38. I don't know, is there nothing good about getting older, is there? People say as you get older, you start to feel more comfortable in your own skin. Yeah, because it's saggier. That's how it is. And I'm not that, I'm not that bothered, just increasingly, in my late 30s, I'm not that bothered about the. the sex anymore. I like it, you know, I have it if it's on offer, but not like I was in my twenties when I was thinking about it a lot. These days I'd rather have a nice sit down and a cup of tea, because uh, here's the thing, every time I have sex afterwards I think, ah, oh, that didn't go quite as well as I'd hoped. But... <laughs> every time I have a nice sit down and a cup of tea, I think, yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed that, that was, uh... <laughs> Do 
I'm getting older, I worry about the future. I worry about the relentless onslaught of technology, where it's afflicted all our lives over the past couple of decades. And, you know, I think the only positive thing to come out of all this technological innovation actually is um, internet pornography. And uh, <laughs> I'll tell you why, most men end up watching pornography on the internet because it's right there, you type one word into a search engine, you've got a million videos sat in front of you, it's almost unavoidable, but most men are not prepared to pay to watch pornography on the internet. Most men are watching the free pornography on the internet. And the reason why the free pornography on the internet is free is because the women in it are atrocious looking. And uh, <laughs> a lot of men watching a lot of pornography with atrocious looking women and the real world effect that that has had is considerably lower of men's standards in terms of what they're capable of finding sexually attractive. So now, if you're a rough looking woman, it's easier than it's ever been to get laid. <laughs> and that is why internet pornography is a victory for feminism. <laughs> Checking the time here. Supposed to do about 40 minutes, I've only got 30 minutes of material, so at the end there's going to be a meat raffle. That's uh... <laughs> <laughs> That's it, you know. I'm a um, 38 year old man, partner, daughter, dog, got pokey little house, mortgage, money worries, I've got um, a weak Aww. bladder. <laughs> Uh, what can we conclude from all that? We can conclude that I am uh, conventional to the point of cliché. I'm conformist to a despicable degree. And yet somehow I managed to craft about uh, 40 minutes of elite level uh, comedy out of it. I don't know how <laughs> many of you sitting there baffled thinking surely someone this good at stand up must have had a very troubled complex past. Nothing could be further from the truth. <laughs> 38 years on this earth, literally nothing interesting's happened to me. Uh, <laughs> In a few moments, I'm going to leave the stage. You're all going to clap like seals, rightly so. Uh, it's only now. I'm not even going to say thank you and good night. I don't want to patronise you. Uh, it's all too clear. You're the ones who should be thanking me for the very special gift my set has been tonight. Uh, a gift you'll almost certainly cherish for the rest of your days. I imagine on your deathbed, you'll turn to the person sitting next to you and say, "Do you remember that time? Do you remember that uh, comedy show in East London? And uh, um, do you remember that? It was a good night, that one." And you'll have a have a little chuckle, and uh, it'll just slip away. <laughs> just slip away with a little smile on your face. That's what I've done for you tonight. <laughs> I've made each and every one of your future deaths just that little bit easier to bear, and you're very welcome. <laughs> well, uh, about a year now, I've been touring a show called um, Clean. A clean comedy show with no swearing, no politics and no smut and uh, you haven't, that, that, none of that's in the show. And, uh, <laughs> but the thing is this, I'll tell you why I'm doing this clean show, I've been doing this clean show, is because um, I like sick jokes. I love sick jokes, I love to hear sick jokes and uh, I love to tell sick jokes. And Because um, life is hard, isn't it? Not just for certain groups of people, for everyone life is a struggle, we're all struggling and sometimes for some people the only way to get through the day is a little bit of gallows humour, isn't it? A sick joke is the only thing that keeps some people going, I'm one of those people. But the trouble is these days, if you make a sick joke, you can hurt someone's feelings and they might decide it's not a joke, it's a personal insult. Someone else might stir the pot and say it's not a personal insult, it's a microaggression, it's hate speech. And then God knows, know, a court of law might decide that hate speech deserves a criminal conviction, a judge might decide that criminal conviction deserves a prison sentence. Maybe you get out of prison six months down the line, a range of employers look at your criminal record, decide they don't want to give you a job, and then a landlord looks at the fact that you're unemployed, decides they doesn't want to give you anywhere to live, and then you're sleeping on a park bench one night, some crazy drunk guy comes along and kicks you to death, and uh, that's why I've been doing a clean tour. That's, uh... <laughs> that's <laughs> you know, I, um, oh, yeah, that's, that's it, more or less. My, uh, my comedy is um, it's very much like uh, a Jew's penis. <laughs> Doesn't have a proper ending. Uh, <laughs> at the time. Uh, <laughs> you've been lovely. Please keep supporting this incredible club and uh, maybe see you all again. Thank you very much.